online. And today we have got lots and lots of images. We're going to crack on. It's uh, 7 30. Yeah. Sorry about the delay. We are going to um, do a good bat today. Uh, and time. strangely enough, weirdly enough, today is going to be partly about last week because since I've got some good images, some of the things I talked about last week, I've actually got the know. images for. So, so that's going to be for, really, uh, really, really helpful. Uh, did it, Dennis Powers? Yes, we do. And actually, do you know, I mentioned a burial. I, I mentioned a burial of somebody that might be linked to the people at Land Dock. Yes, so I've got, I've, I've got the bear. I've got the, uh, I've got photographs of the skull. I got photographs of the body. Um, I, I've got the information about it. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've pretty done. I've done pretty well, actually, to be honest with you. Fantastic. So, so I. I I, you know, that's why that's why we've got to do this one today. And uh, there we go. Light upon me. Oh, you, you can't mm. see me yet. I, I look like an angel. There you go. Look at that. Oh, no. I, I, I almost look like a, a ghostly figure um, in, in the depths, in, in the depths of history, which which is basically where I am. That's what that's where I want to be. So so this is this is where we're going to go now. So. We've used the word dark ages last week a bit. And in other words, I'm, I'm really taking the mickey out the term dark ages because we've got so much information on the dark ages that it, it's, it, it's, it's basically not that, right? So I've actually got the report, the actual report of the skeletal remains, right? Um, I, I don't want to do it all because it's uh, one, two, three, four, um, five, six. It's a lot of pages long, so I really don't want to do that. But uh, we we could actually work out. Uh, we we could actually work out the the the, the date of burial uh, and some information about that. And maybe we could we could talk a little bit about the skull. And th th there's just so much information here. I just can't do it. So it, it's it's looking at the the height of the child. Um, it's look we we think, for example, we think that the child is about six years old. So it's it's not a baby, in other words. So we we we, we need to show, look at the images. We really do. But I I have got a nice little array of images which I want to show you, just sort of off cheek. And you know, when we talk about archaeology, we talk about archaeological evidence. Well, the images show what i've been talking about which which is what we want to see is rather than me saying this has been found or that's been found we c i can actually show you i can show you the objects which which is great one of the things i can't show you is is that the lecture today is is meant to be aiming towards Killian, which we which we've got a lot of images about Killian and a lot of stuff about king arthur as well so we, we again we can't do this period without talking about king arthur and and this, this is this this is basically where we're at. Uh, I've 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 got the I've got the the YouTube thing on just in case anyone wants to join us. So that people are aware. And I would like further ado to take a slurp of my drink. Uh, welcome you tonight. Thanks for being patient. And let's crack on. So let's look at the images. If a dog gets involved tonight, right? I don't want to know. Actually, uh, I've got a cat. Yeah. I, 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 I've got I've got a kitten here, so uh, so I, I, I've got the full array. I've got baby turkey, I, I've got baby sheep, and I've got baby kitten. And the sheep, uh, she's looking rather big, but mind you, so is the male as well. So so is my male ram. He, he's he, tell you what, uh, Ellen, right? Uh, you won't recognise him. He is really big. Oh God, he's filling out. And he's he's sniffing around he's sniffing around one of the girls. So we're gonna have oh. to take we're gonna have to take baby and it looks like uh, baby's mum will be pregnant. Uh, we've got to take the baby you out of the field by I think November because they 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 come into season. Uh, they come into yeah. season in about two months, and and our baby will be will be fully full sized, uh, which which is one of the things. So we've got four people watching live stream now, which is which is absolutely brilliant, and. We are actually back at Dennis Powers. And this is basically the plan that I actually didn't show you last week. 
um, this 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 lovely little um, sort of map shows you the landscape uh, that the that the fort is actually based based within, and you can actually see these weird defences at the bottom, which I didn't show you last week. <laughs> You know what? We've no idea what they what they are. It, it, they, they look very very strange. Those defenses. Obviously, the ones that ones in the top we're really interested in, but we don't know what they are at the bottom. Uh, we we really don't know what they are. And this is I was describing it last week, trying to say that there are other banks and ditches there. But last week it it was somewhat difficult, sort of making you articulate to what I was trying to get at. So we're looking at that, and that looks within the landscape. And you've got what you what you've got within this landscape, which this site overlooks. You've got Cum George on the left hand side, which is usually damp. And over here, you've got the mill race, which is, in fact, you've got all these little bits of rivers here, which is associated. Yeah. One of them is uh, the, the length of the Caliston River, which, which, which actually eventually flows into Dinis Powers. Yeah. There it goes. It goes across this area. There it is. There's the river itself. Uh, this area is extensively flooded on a regular basis in the winter months. And, and do you know what I would like to do? I know this sounds a bit sick. It's, this isn't really nice. But when any of you ever get to hear about Dennis Powers flooding, can you please get out there and take a photograph? And the reason why I want you to take a photograph is I want actually to see how bad it is even today, considering this landscape used to be underwater. It would be it would it would be good to see what the what the sort of um, how how things have changed over the years. So, oh, there we go. Uh, and this is the plan. This is the nice little plan. It's a very odd cut plan. The southern banks. We're not really sure about these southern banks. These these are actually taken from uh, the actual book of Leslie Olcock. This the the actual book from Leslie Olcock. The, these images are actually taken from his book. From 1963, so I, I'm a proud owner of this book. It, it's it's uh, it's the yeah, Ro, it was the year that Roger was born in 1963, so I think Roger was given one of these as a as a little sort of uh, infantile present. Roger, check your attic. So uh, we did do lots of this last week, but what I want us to do is I want to just chuck in some of those images that we didn't do last week. We don't need to do the history. We don't need to do the dates. We don't need to tell you. Um, last week, I gave you a little bit of a diatribe about the Borrowery sheep that I've got. And obviously, the reason why we've got butchered bones at the site, which uh, from from sheep that haven't fully m matured. We've told you that because uh, it, these these really older types of sheep have a tendency to be mature after four or five months. From my experience, four months so and, and my little my little you is only only two months old really so she's uh she, she's not even that and she's really padding it out now another point i actually made last week and we've got quite a few people who've actually online at this minute we've got seven people online one thing that i actually mentioned last week was this problem in the 1960s, before Leslie Olcock, uh, before the 1950s, before Leslie, Leslie Olcock excavated at this site, we knew very, very little about the, the, the Dark Ages, the early medieval period, the, the period of illumination, the period of the saints, the periods of early Christianity. We, we, we had no real idea what was actually going on. And if you look at that there, this, this gives you an idea um, of what we knew about in this period we, we've got number six which was number six number six is Dennis powers that's on there okay mm. okay where, where okay one well, in west wales number eight lucker bank cave we've got some evidence down there okay we're really struggling now we've got to go all the way up to north wales uh, and what we've got we've got a few sites in north wales that we don't need to look at the locations, but that's not many sites really from this period between from the 400s to the 700s. It's not a lot at all. It's really not a lot at all. So what we what we do know now is that is that the information that we know about this dark, the dark age of the early medieval period, or whatever you want to call it, between 476 and 1090, the inf uh, it's basically times 10, right? 
we've we've gone to um Sabra Rydoch on on the likes of Anglesey. Uh, we we've we've got varying ev ev evidence in Barry, a place uh, and we've got more evidence at Landoch as well. We've got the burials that we we we're, we're spitting out at this minute. We've got loads of this information from 476 to 1090. So a, a lot of the early native castle sites really have this early dating stuff, you know, really have, have this early dating genre as now. And this is what's come about. Now, that's, those are the buildings. That's the plan of the buildings at this Dennis Power site. The plan of those buildings, we, we, we've got dates, uh, anything from the 400s to 500, 600s, right? There, there's other evidence to say that people continued living at this site in, to very different degrees all the way through. <laughs> To, for example, uh, the, the period of the Norman ingress into South Wales, which, which, if that's a good word for it, and there it is. There's the entrance way, and basically the entrance way is on this basically very steep side, very steep side, and that steep side itself, that steep side itself on, on the on the eastern side, is is a, is when that's when I, I took my students up there one day, right, and it was so vertical that. Uh, one of them decided not to go up. And then on the way back, we actually found the steps on the way back. So that was another, another di different direction. So <laughs> as you can see, this, this is how the site's developing. And when you think about it, there was no banks and ditches here in the Iron Age. There was no banks and ditches here. In the Roman period, there were banks and ditches in this period from this early stage. And the banks and ditches expanded. And we know the banks and ditches expanded because there they are. There, there's yes. four sets of banks and ditches, really extensive, really massive. They really going into defending something oh. here. Uh, one, one of the things, one of the things that we really think about this landscape of archaeology of the <laughs> medieval period, is that until this site was really excavated, we didn't really know about these dark age defences. We didn't really know. And, and again, I'm using the word dark ages. In I don't like the word dark ages. I even edit it out of my own texts. But from the 1950s, 1960s, it was the dark ages. Now it's illuminated. So it. what 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 we what we've got there? If if we look that there, we've got a nice plan. And what we can see is they put a section all the way through these trenches, right? They 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 put. A Try, they put an excavation all the way through these trenches. And that's actually more or less where the steps are today to actually get onto the site. And these are very deep ditches, as you saw from the images last week. And it may sound as if I'm talking very quick and very fast. What I'm trying to do is really fit in as much information as I possibly can. But now I'm going to calm down a little bit. So this is actually showing you some of the metal work, some of the bronze work that was actually found at the site. Now, oh. wow, it is wow. And it's basically what we're talking about. We're talking about- A Mercedes, the no way. Yeah, yes way, <laughs> yes way, right? You're, you're looking into the eyes of the dark ages. Not very dark now, is it? Not very dark at all. Now, we're, we're lots of this dating, lots of this material, the dates, from the uh, four, five, six hundreds, this metal work. We've I've also got an image of one of the crucibles that was that was probably used to actually create these objects. I've got an image of it. So I, we could discuss this in detail, but what these are is usually you can see that that's fitted onto leather, right? Where these sprues are coming out, that's fitted onto leather. That's fitted. That that's that's giving you an idea of thickness on the right there. Um, that's giving you an idea of thickness, but these are fitted directly into leather eight and number eleven. And again, more, more, yeah, rivets, yes, riveted on, yeah, riveted on. And what what are the, this is when people do when people do reenactment work when they do reconstruction living history work, this type of book. Is the type of book that they love to get hold of so that they can actually from the archaeology get a good impression of what these objects look like and what's an object look like um when it's cast they look like this and they're quite easy to cast if you get the shape if you get the form if you get the direct dimensions of this um, within the archaeology to be able to show you this how is this coming out really clear on your screen yeah mm -hmm. 
Good. So it's not coming out on my not coming out clear on my screen, which is really odd. So what what we've got we've got more of these bronze objects, foldy over objects, belt ends. Um, you, you talk, you're talking about a site that actually has a richness of archaeology, of Bronze Age archaeological evidence. And we're looking at it. We're looking in the eyes. We're not just talking about this in books and just um, flippantly saying, you know, they found metal objects on site and you, you guys don't know what they look like. Now you're looking at these objects. And, and we've actually got silver objects as well. We, we've got, we've got, um, we've got number one. That, that's a silver, silver object there. It, there, we've got a bit of silver there. Uh, we've got two um, and four. So that's that's lead. So what 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 is what is two? Is that it, you know it's made of lead? So it, it's going to be quite um, quite bendable. Maybe four could be some kind of loom weight. And obviously we've got a bit of zinc, a zinc bead. Yeah. So so what we've got we on site we've got bronze. We've obviously got iron. Yeah. We've got silver. We've got Z, lead. We've got zinc. Unfortunately, a spinning weight. A spinning weight, anything like that. But and you, could talk, you could talk about a spinning weight, but we've actually got it. Um, you know, we've got a loom weight, we've got a spinning weight. You know, we, we've got the evidence. We're looking at history. These are little postcards from the past. These are little bits of history. And the, that there, these are actually these are actually lo, little bits of crucible. And actually, because I don't have a scale there, it might be helpful. If, if I give you an idea of the scale of these objects. So I'm just going to have a quick flick. I might be able to get the scale up anyway uh, from the image. Uh, now, okay, so the the scale of uh, that object on the left is about four centimetres in diameter, right? These are tiny little crucibles. But when you think about it, oh. if you're smelting silver, gold, lead, zinc, bronze, or tin, you're going to need little crucibles to pour into little moulds. A is the lid of the crucible, or A is likely to be the lid of the crucible on the left. So these are really, really small objects. Obviously, bigger than a thimble, when, when you think about it, yeah, for, for um, four centimetres, you could probably get a lot of silver in, in that crucible. If you're going to sort of, that's going to be enough to do a few rings. That's going to be enough to, to do anything, really. But these are the crucibles. And the, actually, right, in absence of somebody saying that we're smelting objects in here or manufacturing objects in here, why the hell have we got a crucible there if they weren't doing that? You're not going to get a crucible down the road and bring it there and not use it, right? So we're obviously making these metal objects from the ore at the site. As we know, bronze, zinc, lead, silver, and we've obviously got iron, right? All we need is a bit of tin now to have the bronze and the copper, okay, to, to, to make the bronze objects that we've actually seen. Now this is this is a bit of an odd one. We, we've 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 got some iron objects, and this this isn't this isn't actually my clearest image. I, I do apologise on that, but this is it. This isn't the clearest. Um, actually, we got we got we got this. What these are wrong? These are not metal objects. These are actually bone objects. Sorry about that, folks. These are all bone objects, and you can actually you can actually get an idea of skill of the bone objects. The ones on the top left, one to two, are going to be the likes of hairpins. Lots of these objects are very similar to other objects that have been found at Cranogs. So these bone objects are typi typically um, and typifying that period where we've got all types of material being used and we're going into this sort of period that, that we've got these objects, these bone objects, they're really, really well preserved. Number 15, for example, it describes number 15 as a metacarpal of a sheep. Uh, this is a bobbin for uh, winding wool for weaving, right? Now, mm. some, of, some of these, are not all of these objects, are, 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 not all of these objects are from um, an Iron Age, uh, not from, they're not all from an early medieval co context. Some of these are from an Iron Age context, but it actually does give you an idea of the preservation of the objects on site, whether it's from the Iron Age or this period of the Dark Ages, this early medieval period that this site actually spans from and to. Now, this itself 
We don't need any introductions on this. This is a rotary quern. Um, and this, this rotary quern itself is so that you can grind your grain on site. Now, this, this, is, this is very, very important because we've got evidence of, we've got evidence of uh, grain at the site. We, we, we've got, we, we know that obviously collecting this onto the site. We, we've got some burnt evidence in the halves. What, we, what we've got, we've got a big stone, uh, number 13. And we, what, what, what we've got as well is, um, is a stone bearing number 12. So what that is, that's going to be um, to assist the rotary quern to go around. So that's, that's what um, that stone bearing, I do believe, is going to be for. So we've obviously got a full array of archaeological evidence at this site. And what this does, it actually tells you that the site itself is very, very much going places. And what we do find is that one of the cross sections of one of the banks at Dinis Powys, and you can see that it's 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 made it's 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 sat on the rock, it's made of all this rubble, uh, mm. it's made of all this material is built up to create a bank, it's on this flat plate, and this itself, and, and you can get an idea that uh, the, these people are just thinking right, what we've got to do, we've got to build this bank up from fresh. So these stones have been quarried from the the local limestone and it's it's been this this, this itself again is giving you a cross section of one of these banks and obviously give you an idea of the train changes um, and the depth of the archaeology and the depth of the archaeology definitely one one thing one thing that we we usually find about dark age early medieval sites is that the preservation isn't really good this site does have great preservation. Uh, Cardiff University do occasionally go to take students to train them at the site, which I think is a really bad idea. Students are green. They're not really well trained. So you need professional archaeologists excavating at a site like this. And those professional archaeologists were obviously excavated there in the 1950s. Oh, there it is. Look at that. We're looking into the eyes of one of the fireplaces. Oh. So a fireplace. <laughs> I know it might sound blasé, typical no, no, archaeology, not but yeah. not at all. This, this is actually, you know, there was images after images of pottery um, with, within this, right? And uh, what, what, one, of the, one of the things that, that we, uh, you know, that there's, there's lots of really nice text here. Uh, you, you could go through pages and pages of text. There's a whole book about this. Uh, and it, ta it talks about... It, it, it talks about the, the, the depth and breadth of this site. The book that I've actually got, the, the one excavation from 1956 to 1959. And the book has 200 and, here we go, it's talking about grain, it's talking about charcoal at the end as well, smelting. It's, it's 219 pages of text and images. So it's quite a tome. And that there, those little symbols. Ooh. You can see little now. I have on the front uh, on the front <gasps> of this book. Birds. Right, birds. You've got on one image. You've got. Um, I'm not showing you this one because I, on one the front cover of the book actually has these sort of racing hairs um, on one stamp, which has got six racing hairs, and these got little birds as a stamp of of, of the pot, pot, the diverse pottery that this site um, actually takes us to. And, and, and there it is. So we've got these birds um, stamped on this shirt. This, this is, by the looks of it, this looks like it's it the says they're felines. Oh, well, they look like birds to me. Mm. Oh, yeah, definitely birds, yes. What did I say? Oh, that says well, felines, they, not they, birds. They're definitely, they, I don't know. I don't the feet. caption I don't, says running felines. I don't know many felines that have beaks. No. Oh, maybe there's actually, a there's maybe there's a missing view above. Actually, actually, right. Do you know what? Do you know what, right? What what what? What what? Uh, if you actually I have made um the, there's one another interpretation of, of this, right? 
there's another interpretation, right? Our interpretation, uh, they look like beaks, agreed? Yeah. But, but the interpretation the archaeologists get is if you turn that beak into an ear, right, and that into a paw, these could be equally running felines. That's what, that's what, the, that's and they could be birds' face. I get, I, this is so funny. It's like, it's like one of those puzzles, or what is it? I don't know. Um, and there, there is one that if you look at it one way, it's a duck, and the other way, it's a rabbit. Yes, similar. Do, do, you know, do you know, it is, it is similar, but that clearly looks like a book, a, a beak on the left. That really does. It does. That, well, it looks like it, a beak on the, on the right figure. The beak is on the left of the right figure, can I, can and I, there's can a I, beak on the right of the left figure. Can I can I just can I just um, say that um, on the cover of the book shows an image of six running rabbits, not felines. Right. I, I think this image on the front doesn't represent another piece of pottery. I think it actually that represents this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come off. I'm going to come off screen a minute, and I and I want to show you this, and you can make up your own mind. It's 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 good to actually do that. So where have we got? We've got stop that share. Uh, and what I need to do, I need to get this image. I need to get rid of this image. We need to get rid of the background image, and I need to show you this. Right, and I need to show you. Hang on a minute. Can you see that on the front of the book? You look like lambs. They look like lambs, yeah. <laughs> Baby lambs. They look like little lambs. It, does that look like the image that we just seen? It does. A, yes, it, it does, does a bit. Yes. But where did the rest but, of them go? Where have they come but from? Then, then, then again, what they've done is they've done a reconstruction based on that. They, they've ignored the fact that it actually looks like a beak to me. It, it really, but going back to the other image, it, it for me it does look a bit like they they look like beaks. I've got to be honest with you. Right, anyway, we we've got off on a bit of a tangent, right? But this these are the stamps uh, which have been found on the site, and also look at that there. It says a fragment of a lead die, right? That's the one that we saw earlier on. Number two. We can't see anything. Um, Oh right, hang on a minute. Sorry, um, you right. you still got you still got me on screen. I'm sorry. Right, okay, hang on. We've got nothing on screen. We got nothing on screen. Okay. Um, I got you know I did I you, you don't know this, Ellen, right? In in the pandemic, right? I I was I was given I was doing seven, I was doing um seven days of lectures, and usually some of those days I would do more than two lectures. I think one day I did three. Right, and this went on for month after month after month, right? And I was so into, I was so sort of programmed to do these lectures. There was this one lecture I did for a whole hour, and um, I was I was telling people about the images, and at the end, somebody said it would have been nice if we'd have seen some images in the lecture. Mm. <laughs> and I'm, no, I'm, I'm, now they tell you. Nobody told me that throughout the whole lecture they haven't seen a single image. Apparently, the lecture was so therapeutic, it sent most people to sleep and they were just enjoying <laughs> me talk. They just enjoyed me talking. <laughs> right. So, so what, what we do, we have that, that there, we've got a lead die. Right. Um, when, I, when you use the word die, I always think about a die as in a dice. Right. Um, but I'm trying to translate what that exactly is to. That's two is going to be associated with a belt. Um, three, um, four decorative, and five's obviously attached as some kind of riveted, fastened. But those two, three, four, four, five are bronze objects, and that's giving you a, an idea of this lead object. And now, are we? Oh, and somebody, somebody just mentioned the the image that we did show. Uh, Patch's dog said that they look like hairs. But I, oh, and also last night, right? I don't know if any of you guys joined me last night online, right? Uh, but it um, it was definitely interesting. Uh, we 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 did we did online on YouTube actually on Sunday, and uh, we 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 did loads of different stuff. And uh, anyway, so we'll be, we'll be doing that on Sunday as well. 
Now, there, there you go. You've got this really nice fireplace. You've got the really side. You've got uh, the nice base. Uh, oh, we're going back on ourselves. Um, and there. Are you saying that piece was a die? When it, says, when it says a die, right, what do we mean by a die? Is it like a stencil kind of thing? I, I don't know. Because I was going to ask whether it was something like uh, in craft, we have cutting dies. Where we press a piece of metal into things to make the shape. Right, as in, as in, as a in cutting basically. Die. Okay, yes, that right. makes sense. <laughs> what, what we need to do, we've, we've, we've gone over this object too quick, actually. So maybe what we should do is, is actually see what the description actually does say. Yeah. Um, I guess what we've got coming up, we've got um, Dark Age Glass, which comes from the continent, which we're going to which we're going to have a look at. Hang on, I just I'm just trying to get um, this image. Uh, we've got that there. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Crucible. We need to go. Keep going. Keep going. Nearly done. Nearly done. Something though, pages it? and pages of um, pages and. Pages. It's like a face. I know I've seen that. We got we got loads of we got <laughs> loads of metal man. iron objects <laughs> and me metal work. Okay, metal work. This object um, number one. Are we going to get it? Number one. It says no, not that. Sorry, guys. We, we we'll try and do this and. Oh, it doesn't seem to be one that give me a choice. Oh, here we go. Right, okay. In, in Right, there on the description is number one. On this description is number two. It says a lead strip of circular section at one end um, and of flatter, wider section at the other. This is evidently a fragment from some larger object, while well, we agree with that, which has been cut off at the wider end and twisted off at the other. The wide end bears ornament in relief which continues up to the point at which the section becomes circular. The lowered field of the ornament appears to have been deliberately toughened. Both form and ornament reveal that this fragment is related to the Irish series of zoomorphic penannular brooches. Uh, how does this, how does this, right, uh, with <laughs> enamel terminals, the wide end corresponds to uh, one of the terminals and the circular end to part of the hoop of such a brooch. Yes. Yeah, Though the pattern on the terminal has no actual okay. analog elements in it, may be compared to objects from Ireland. Uh, the cross, the cross bar, uh, and the drop-shaped motif. There you go on the left at the hoop end are clearly the last vestiges of the animal eye and snout of a zoomorphic penannular brooch, which is circular. And though they too lack precise parallels, they are apparently similar to one of the terminals. Um, it, it's it's not telling me. There's got lots. It's got lots of. Uh, hang on, man. there there is something about the die bit here. The most reasonable suggestion is that this fragment comes from a model or die used to form the mold for casting a brooch. The molds from the moat. Um, the moat actually, well, there was talking about another site actually here. Um, it's talking about the, the molds at a site in Ireland. They, they've got similar objects. At Dinner's Palace, we appear to have a fragment from a complete pattern brooch. So this pattern of or positive model would have been stamped into soft, fine clay to form a mold. Subsequently, the lead models would have been cut, cut up melted and used for fresh patterns. A dinner's uh -huh. pound, we have a fragment which was lost on the way to the melting pot. That is part of a thing, um, circular brooch. So it looks like they were actually manufacturing these on site. Because that pattern reminds me, you know, the Saxon hoard. Um, oh, oh God. Nice it, 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 things and stuff. And yeah. had, that looks to me like a... Uh, uh, the bit on the flattened part, it, it looks like a, a man's face of a helmet. Yes, it does, the doesn't nose it? And moustache. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would, I would, 
Um, would, it, would it be like it would it be like similar? Because if you turned it sort of like onto its side, it looked like a wild boar. But when oh, it comes God. back on this side, it oh, looks like. Oh bloody hell! Let's do it. <laughs> No, oh, freaking day, right? Come on, there. Let's do it, then. Right? Okay. Let's move <laughs> this on the screen. Right? Let's do what you want. Not that side. There. Zoom in. And there. No, it's upside down. Yes. You want it the other way? All right, then, lovelies. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> it also looks a bit like a tapeworm's head. <laughs> Stop a minute. If this like is like the helmet, then it would be the other way round. What's that, Rog? Leg of pork or something. It looks very odd. You know, I, I gl I'm glad we've come to that, right? But I've got to say that we've got to crack on. But <laughs> but obviously that's food for thought. We, You know what? We could always come back to this. We, You know what we could do? We, we could do another yeah. five weeks of the Dennis Powers excavation, every single detail, including a detailed look at the human remains, which we're going to be seeing in a few moments. Look at that oh, yes. air comb there. Crazy. Where are these from? It's not from the same site, Roger. That's all we're doing. Well, the, these, the, these, these are actually from the Dinner's Power site as well, Rog. Right. Good. All right. We're, we're, we haven't got, you know, we haven't moved anywhere else, Rog. We've just been doing it Dinner's Power, lovely, right? Obviously, well, in case more you're preparing for something else. More, more of these bone combs, right? And uh, again, this goes to show that the the, the di diverse depth of archaeological evidence at the site and this is only this is only from this is only from a small area of the of the site that's been excavated look what could look what else could be in the ditches mm. now it is talking about it's talking so much about many of these pieces of rather indifferent parallels on those irish early christian sites there, there's lots there's lots in the way of links between Ireland and this site, you know, there's, there's, oh, I've got to say this, in in Ireland, they, they've excavated 10 times the amount of, of, of early medieval sites than we had at this stage, right, so mm. anything that we find, have, we usually have parallels in Ireland, right, so lots of these, lots of these, the, the style, comp, these composite combs, for example, it, it's used in terms like Dark Age, Celtic. Um, you're, you're talking about these um, the, 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 these Irish, Irish influenced trade objects, right? But these are actually found at this site, hmm. and you can actually see the, those little. Basically, that's that's a little sort of hand drill, more or less, into the bone. Yeah, right. That that's that that's that's a hand drill into the bone, and. What 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 we've got again is diversity of evidence, and when we think about it, can we just all remind ourselves, get a grip of this, Carl? Can we all remind ourselves this is only probably about um, if we excavated a whole site. This is out of bone, right? This is probably um, less than five percent of the items that have survived, <laughs> and this. Is only a small proportion of the, those that are on the site, of the rest of the site that hasn't been excavated. So, so again, again, that 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 diversity, guys. This is glass. Cool. Wow. Hmm. Not necessarily um, made there, though. Any... No, 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 no. This is, you know, you know. At the beginning last week, and at the beginning, I said about getting access to the site via via the sea, right. Um, high tide, being able, to, um, in, particularly in the winter months, being able to get here um, all the way to the base of this site uh, because it's marshy, because it's wet. Um, yes. The entire landscape gets, as I say, with about the Dennis Powers thing now, I want photographs of the flooding. But I know that sounds macabre, but I, I need it um, for, for future lectures to basically say that's our evidence because it happens today. And what what we what we've what we've clearly got there is we've got trade objects that have come all the way from the Middle East. Oh, all right. Now Very the cool. other point the, the other point I'd like to make um, is that um, to get glass objects to this site, you're not gonna you're not gonna transport them over land. They're gonna break. 
so, so what you are going to do, you're going to get these, you're going to trade these objects to the site um, via water, right? And it base, it basically, we're, we're, we're talking, uh, we're, we're talking quite extensively uh, about um, there's five objects, like there's five objects that have actually been excavated at this site. And uh, it, my, my, my direct, uh, my, my direct notes are not corresponding with the image, but you can get an idea that these, uh, these come from the continent. And uh, they they are green, they are green glass, cobalt blue glass that is typically uh, Israeli, sort of that area, sort of Egypt. Um, so you mm. get an idea of, of not just common gr uh, glass, but you, you're actually getting, and that's, that's handle, that's a handle. Uh, for for a, a glass object of uh, some kind of beaker. So you, you've got these objects coming all the way from the continent, very, very rare, very easily broken. But again, this is more of a clue to the richness of the archaeology and the trade objects. Whatever these people were actually producing on site was trade value, right? Mm. People, oh, it, they, they were very wealthy people on the site with the wealth that they were producing and the wealth that they were bringing in right so whatever they were what they they were smelting they they, they were um slaughtering animals uh, they they were they were probably making um bone objects on the site the one thing is if we got a massive load of material on the site it might indicate that that's what they're doing they're producing the material on the site but they're not they're not producing glass right we we were able to there there are there is evidence that glass, some glass was produced in a Roman period in Britain, but when we get to the early medieval period, which this actually dates from, glass production probably ceases, right? But there's no reason to say that if they excavated a little bit more on site, they might actually find some glass objects that were produced in Britain. But mm. then again, they would have to have gone out via water all the way along the coast to the city or anyway. Now there is our skeleton of our child, right? Oh, very sad. Yes, very, very sad. But let's remember this child by talking about her. Right. And I'm very aware it's uh, it's 8.13, but I was late. We, we have already done over 40 minutes of the lecture. So I still got to try and get hold of some of the Kalean stuff. Right. And basically the report of this body, the archaeological evidence for the dating the burial is very slight. Now, what it says is fragments of crucible were found in the grave, right? That's mm. very interesting, right? Crucible for smelting. If they came there as part of the filling of the grave, they suggest that it cannot be earlier than the phase that it comes to, right? So about 500 years AD. And a possible, so what we need to do, we need to go on to the skull. Right, oh. there's a reconstruction of the spots and the suitors in the skull haven't exactly come together yet. Right, so that's looking at the skull. One thing that we can tell about the teeth, a, poss a possible check may be provided by comparing the degree of fossilization of the human teeth with those of domestic animals found in the same environment to get an idea of the date of this individual. Now, when this report was being written and this was being excavated, We'll add Libby's radiocarbon dating that really hadn't reached us yet, right? However, when 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 this is then being discussed in 1961 by a Mr. Boyd, it it talks about the the teeth um, and the way that there's that the enamel um, and dentine is built up on the teeth. It discusses that in detail. It says that the sex and age of the child, to establish the probable sex, age and stature of the child whose skeletal remains were found at this site, um, what, what we need to do is this has been determined by various experts. So what we're going to do, we're going to run to the chase. The skeleton of the child which was examined, showed the following features. Are you ready? It was a girl. Wow. How could they tell without DNA? 
I can, thought I was ah. going to tell about, there's a thing in the back of the neck that... that the, the, uh, well it's not just that what they did what they did um what they did kate right they had so much of a full set of skeletal remains they were able to look at the radius the ulnar they were able to identify all these different characteristics as compared with other bodies and other sexes of bodies right. and hence put into the identify then this is why you know <laughs> it, it's there's loads of science here, and I and, and it's just trying to fit this into sort of. Oh, give I get you, it. That's like um, that's like profiling. That's like criminal yes, profiling. profiling. It's yes. just comparing, yeah. comparing for forensic with profiling, for forensic There's archaeology. Something yeah. at the back of the head that so, determines whether it's good or boring. But for the back of the head, the, the orbital bone is, and all the rest of it is still developing in that essence. But. Yeah. What they have with all these experts identified, you know, th this is this one set of human remains, right? That had traveled, um, it had traveled to the hospital, it had traveled to various experts. They, they had measured the bones. There's expert after expert on this. It says, here we go. We it we know about the age because the first molar tooth is normally fully erupted in the sixth year. And so it is estimated that the probable dental age of the child was five and a half to six. All the second molar teeth could be seen, although they had not yet erupted. So between five and a half and six years old. The height of the child, uh, give, or give or take flesh and give or take all the rest of it. The height of the ch child was probably up to um, 121 centimeters in height as a fully fleshed individual. And that was the amount of consideration that they gave to this one set of human remains. When they found over a thousand sets of human remains at the back of Landock Church um, in 1994, obviously they, they didn't give it this level, those, those all those individuals, this level of investigation. But my, my ideas are, is that this could actually be linked that I, I, it would be great to do DNA testing uh, with the samples that we've got from the oh, land doc yeah, yeah. set of human remains with this to see if this individual is related to them and if any of them. All we need is one person from land doc to be related to, related to this individual, and then all the theories that did its powers um, had been occupied, then it was abandoned, and then they went. And to what might be the teeth, Carl? Say that, Rod. What might be in the teeth to see what they've been eating, and perhaps they, the foreigners. Obviously, the the strontium and all the rest of it. And Roger, there's so much more to be uh, analysed and said about this this skull, this one individual. And you know, when we really take time on archaeology, we can learn so so much. And that's naturally why I'm going through all my stuff. And and you know, this is why I spent. One of the things, right, I've been an irresponsible archaeologist over the years. I, I've excavated a lot of sites. Um, um, one quarter of the sites that I've excavated because I've been paid by developers to do it. I've, I've published all them. But all the rest of the stuff is in boxes and I'm working on it. But with all the knowledge that I've built up now, I could do those reports like, like a breeze, right? And now I could take more time doing them. And when you can take more time, you can get more information. That's my excuse. Right. So finally, what I want us to do, we, we've got, let, let's just give it a nice sort of 10, 12, 13, 40 minutes, so 10 minutes at least on this. And uh, we will, we can ask any questions about Dennis Powers in a, in a short while. But one thing I wanted to talk about is this site. We're actually at Killian, uh along the River Esk. And this, this site itself is a fascinating, amazing site. And we won't be critical of anybody. What we'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll set out the, the evidence. And I've got some snippets on the screen that I'm going to be reading out. And you could take notes and, and any names and stuff on the screen, you can write them down, right? So I've done the lazy approach today, sorry. But these are actually black and white photographs of the excavations um, from the 1920s, and uh, 1925 actually, 1926. And obviously before the site was handed over to the Ministry of Works to conserve it, and some beautiful images there. Basically, so that there. Multiple well, right, Roger. So multiple wheeler started the excavation and then left and left it to everybody else to dig. Yeah. 
But Sir Mortimer Wheeler gets the credit. Basically, Sir Mortimer Wheeler was going down to London saying, give us your Wonga, right, to continue the excavations. And that's what they did. But we'll, mm. we'll, then we'll come across that in the text. Now, oh, God, um, as you can see, all of those images I want to do still, and we're not going to do it tonight, but what we're going to do, um, what we've got, these images that we've been seeing are actually from what's called the Clay family collection, who photographed the excavations in 1925, 1926, uh, excava uh, photographed the amphitheater excavations and the placing uh, field excavations, the barrack excavations, actually at Killian. And the barracks that are on display at Killian are actually are, are actually underneath the surface. They they've 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 put sort of uh, they they've reconstructed some of it on top. But those are the only some of the only barracks on display anywhere in Europe. So there we go. We're on to it. Killian has long been associated with King Arthur. Delve into the legend, find out how it developed and trace its links with Killian. So that's where we're going to go. So uh, what, what we do, we start off with this blurb on the screen. Right. And I'm going to read it out. I don't often do this, but we're going to read it out. And anyone that wants me to spell anything out, out, I don't need to because you could see it on the screen. So during the years 500 to 550, I might add lib, lib, a little bit, the Britons appear to be ha have, have held back the um, Saxon advance in Cornwall and Wales. The territory held by the Saxons eventually became known as England. And the people in Wales were called Welsh from the Saxon word um, fiechla, meaning foreigners. It's worth noting that the Welsh called themselves Cymru, um, meaning fellow countrymen and their country Cymru. And I, I actually, um, I, I, I was actually um, um, spell checking. I, I, I did, I, I was spell checking um, some of my text for a YouTube uh, recording that I did about O England Do a Day on the 16th of September. And uh, <coughs> instead of using the word Cymru with a Y, they use Cymraig. And I thought Cymraig refers to the language. So whenever you go on these um, spell spelling things online, I thought, right, always be careful. But that, that's that's where that comes into it. Now, the importance of this division is that the Saxon conquerors were hardly likely to be interested in the exploits of a foreign leader who was successful in holding them at bay. Maybe it is for this reason that Arthur is not mentioned in early uh, English chronicles, while his name occurs in Welsh ones. And again, Historia Britonium. Now, lots of people don't put much salt on Historia Britonium, but it was a work of, um, do we call him a Welsh monk? Or do we call him a monk of Cymru? Um, in the year 830, Nidius, uh, the monk Nidius, Nidius. Latin. Name. <laughs> um, surprisingly, it refers to Arthur as a warrior, not a king. He lists 12 battles fought by Arthur, including Mount Baden and the City of the Legion, which is Ooh. very much believed to be Killian. Now, the problem is with written history is you either believe it or, or you don't. Right. So unfortunately, lots of hi history is done by a narrative. And you can't always believe everything written down. So, for example, when when we've we've got our Barry Plaston present page, if um, Ruth Ruth is on it, I'm on it, and Kate's on it. Uh, people put in people cut and paste stuff from Wikipedia, right? And there's me. I've researched stuff and written stuff and pub had it published in the newspapers, and that stuff is completely wrong. So I say this is my take on it, right? And but in many ways. As 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 a microcosm of of this problem, there is something in everything written down, whether it's completely factual, where there's a myth or a legend, there's a fact waiting to be told. I always tell people that the these documents, though interesting, do not help us understand the roots of the legend. But there's something there. Right. So there we go. Here we go. The city of the Legion. Could well be Killian. Killian is known to have had a large civilian population living immediately outside the fortress walls. So it certainly would have been considered as being a city. However, the Roman legion had probably left mostly by the year 120, 125 AD. Right. Yes. So the center of Killian was abandoned. 
and that became a city of the people. And my my biggest problem with the with the amphitheater will come up shortly. So what what we've got we've got another fella who's mentioned is Geoffrey of Monmouth in 1133 that set writers weaving new versions of the legend right, right, right across Europe. And we are talking about Killian. Monmouth is just 20 miles from Killian. And as a historian, he just, he must have been impressed by the splendid Roman remains, which we know existed then. So he basically thought, right, all right then, it's got to be Killian that, the, that this place of the City of the Legions is. In his work, Historia Regium Britannia, he described how Arthur held court at Killian. He also tells us of this state of the remains at Killian. Even the bathhouses are still standing to their original height, vaults above. So he's referring to the city of the Legion as Nennius was referring to. And he talks about, well, you could, you know, in many ways, some of this might be based on something, not all of it, but some of this is based on something. It's like it, it's like a it's like a ghost story. I saw a dog in the wood and it chased me down the lane. The next minute I saw a dog in, in the wood. It, it had massive red eyes and it, it was on a lead. Right. Next minute, there's three people. Right. Now, I, I have seen ghostly dogs. Right. I've written about them in my book, word for word. But somebody might take that book in years time and say I was attacked by that dog. So yeah. there is something. So when the feast of Whitsuntide began to draw near. So Whitsuntide, is that May the 1st? Am I wrong there? Or have I got that wrong? Arthur, mm -hmm. who, oh, is that Whitsunday? When is Whitsunday? Is that in May? Am I right? Don't worry. Uh, let's move on. Wits Suntide began to draw near. Arthur, who was quite overjoyed by his great success, remember he fought 12 battles, made up his mind to hold a, a plenary court at that season and place the crown of the kingdom on his head. He decided too, to summon to his feast the leaders who owed him homage so that he could celebrate Whitson with greater reverence and renew the closest pacts of peace with his chieftains. He explained to the members of his court what he was proposing to do and accepted their advice that he should carry out his plan in the City of the Legions. How much of that is based on anything, we don't know. But the City of the Legions coming from Nennius. And we know that Killian exists. Killian does exist. We excavated the amphitheatre. Situated, uh, but obviously the ex the amphitheatre was was filled in with a lot of mud at this stage in 1133. Probably mud from the River Usk, not far from the Severn, in a most pleasant position, and being richer in material wealth than other townships, this city was eminently suitable for such a ceremony. Right. The river which I have named flowed by it on one side and up this the kings and princes who were to come from across the sea could be carried in a fleet of ships on the other side which was flanked by meadows and wooden, wooded groves. They had adorned the city with royal palaces and by the gold painted gables of its roofs it was a match for Rome. Now that's interesting because from another source, I know he describes the remains of Killian, and I, I've never been able to find that since. And also that you could wander around the streets of Killian and you could obtain Roman coins, right? In another part of his, his work, Geoffrey states that Killian had an archbishop. And from the context, we can deduce that this man, this was a man with considerable power and influence. It goes. After the death of Uther Pendragon, the leader of the Britons assembled from their various provinces in the town of Silchester, and they're suggested to Dubricus, the Archbishop of the City of the Legions, that as their king, he should, he should crown Arthur, son of Uther Pendragon. He called the other bishops to him and bestowed the crown of the kingdom upon Arthur. Arthur was a young man, only 15 years old. 
Right. Now, don't don't give me that thing that people then didn't live a long age. I was reading a document recently and people were saying, oh, right, it wasn't unusual for people to have 60, 70, 80 year olds in their village. And some people thought that wasn't old. Look at Roger, he's 70. So he'd be a very old person back then. So in Jeffrey's account, us, Roger, I'm sorry, you are 71, but I, I didn't want to tell everybody. It makes you seem old. So in, in Jeffrey's account, thank you, Roger, don't mention it. John, um, so in Jeffrey's account, Killian was an important location even before Arthur. It had an archbishop who crowned the king. It was a splendid place, and it was where Arthur held a very important court. Jeffrey does not make any mention of Camelot. But there's one thing about this, right? There's one... If you want to forget about all that and call it nonsense, right? But there's one fact. The remains at Killian would be still massively impressive back then. And you go to Killian today, you can still see the walls. You can still see the amphitheater. You can still see the remains of the uh, bathhouse. You can still see the remains of the barracks. So, so in many ways, what we've got is there is some truth in what he's saying. What truth you can work out yourself. It's not for me to make up your truth. You're the ones with the brains, and so am I, but you can make up your own minds. We're talking about Critian de Troia, written some 50 years after Geoffrey. It's also most inconceivable. The inspiration of this creation was not the Chilean um, described by uh, by um, Geoffrey. Critian de Troia is um, a historian in the likes of uh, France. Had Arthur made Chilean his base, base, it is unlikely he would have used the Roman site this would have been too large to defend. I agree. The castle mound inside, um, the, uh, in, inside the mound, the mound, dates from a later time, um, around 1085. The castle mound inside Killian is way after the King Arthur date by 500 years. It's a Norman mound. Although there is an interesting story which links this to Arthur, his most likely course of action would have been to reuse a substantial Iron Age hill fort just a short distance away. I think that's absolute poppycock. I believe that I believe there's there's a link with the amphitheater, and I'm going to tell you in a few moments why that is. We don't need to learn any more there. It mentions Tennyson, um, eight eighteen fifty six. Uh, for centuries, the site of the Roman amphitheatre in Killian was known as King Arthur's Round Table. Yes, why is that? Back in the um, 1587, Thomas Churchyard wrote of Killian in a big poem, actually. And actually, you'll be happy to hear that I'm reprinting Romans in South Wales, and there's a little bit about Killian in it, which wasn't in the in the special edition, it wasn't in the first edition. And I put in a little poem in there that might be just worth built, uh, buying the book to read the poem. In Arthur's time, a table round was where at he sat. As yet a plot of goodly ground sets forth that rare estate. But the first bit is nice. In Arthur's time, a table round was where at he sat. As yet a plot of goodly ground. The next bit just doesn't go with it. Um, it would surely have been an excellent place for, um, for a leader to address his followers. But mm. just address his followers, that's great. If there was any wooden evidence, it would have been destroyed at the time of the excavations in the in the nineteen twenties. So here we go. Uh, this this then goes on with the the Camelot stuff. And sorry, guys, we'll go up until twenty two, and that's it. Sorry, it's getting on late. The place named Camelot does not occur in early versions of the story of Arthur. However, Geoffrey of Monmouth, eleven thirty three, tells how Arthur held court at the city of the legions, and leaves us in little doubt that this was Killian. Certainly Killian would have been a, a most impressive location for Arthur to hold court for important rulers with splendid Roman remains. Equally, he can be sure that only a professional army could defend the Roman fortress ruins. If Killian was more than just a meeting place for Arthur, he must look to the surrounding hilltops. Why is he talking like that? I don't get it. Uh, you know, the, the, author, the person writing this uh, and the people writing it at the time forgets the state of the Roman remains still standing at Clear. And also the other thing as well is if you look at Cardiff Castle, the state of the Roman remains um, that were still standing at Cardiff Castle when the Normans got there were still impressive by the remains that still exist today, excavated by William Burgess in, eight, in, in 1877 and rebuilt. In Camelot, the... 
the great stones and the marvellous works of Iron Lion Underground and the Royal Vaults, which many now living have seen. Um, and then, obviously, that goes on. And it talks about Cadbury Castle. It talks about Cadbury Castle being the Camelot and Loch Caleon, which is in Somerset. We don't want to do that now. Um, but I think it's dismissive of the amphitheatre, full stop. Here we go. Um, it, it again talks about the Historia Bretonium, whether you want to t listen to the Historia Bretonium as giving you some um, some bearings on the Arthurian legend. That's again up to you. Um, Historia Bretonium records Killian as one of Britain's third. Uh, 33 cities nearby Cowent is also listed just because it was once a um, and just because it was once a legionary base doesn't mean to say it was a city which it would have been an important town or city after the Roman military had buggered off now that's what, what I'm going to do now is just four minutes of images and there's a point there's the archaeological excavation I've got an aerial view of what that used to look like before it was excavated and this is my point, right? Lots of people say that this was built at the same time as the Roman as the Roman military base, right? Now, if you look quite clearly by the reconstructions, these reconstructions show that you could clearly look into the fort, right? So, as 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 somebody that studied military stuff for years, right? If you're going to put this directly in in line of fire from the fort that you're trying to defend, it's yeah. it's a really crap idea to build an yeah. amphitheater directly outside the wall, right? All the archaeologists and their dog claim that the Kalean amphitheater was built by the Roman military, right? Whilst they were building the Roman fort. That is absolute nonsense. And, and when you look at the when you look at the amphitheater, you will notice stones that have been taken from the Roman military base. So who built the amphitheater? Did the Roman military build it as a little gift before they left, which is likely, or did somebody else build it after the Roman um, military base was abandoned? That's food for thought, right? But mm. this itself would be a defendable location for anybody. You could defend that. It's small enough. It, it's uh, even today, right? Even today, that's what that's what it looked like from the excavations, right? Even today, that's what that looks like today, right? Uh, obviously, again, as I said, there was a lot more there. There was a lot more there at the time of Jeffrey the Monmouth, and there was a lot more more there at the time of Arthur in the five hundreds and if it stood like this easily defendable site but unfortunately did we actually find any evidence of this being a defendable site when it was excavated the answer is no poir. well they needed to excavate this site quite rapidly because readers reading the times in london were paying for the excavation and when our um sir mortimer wheeler was going back and forth to london uh, people were saying, right, we want, they, he was doing a daily report. They needed results. Have you found the amphitheatre yet? So they had to go through it, right? Um, unfortunately, only some early medieval material from the time of Arthur was actually found. The rest of it was carted away and put, in a, put somewhere. And I don't even know where this somewhere was. And that, I know it's a bit blurred, right? I know it's a bit blurred. So if we, that is what it used to look like. So if you sit back, you can see it's a little bit of a hair look. That's probably in the 1700s, right? Mm. That's the wall from outside, even now. Look at that wall. That wall wow. stands two, three metres tall today, right? So how tall was it standing in the time of King Arthur, right? Um, and there it is. That's the gateway. And there is Sir Mortimer Wheeler, who took over the archaeological excavation. That's the gateway. That's the southern gateway, 
which actually had enough remains of the arch to reconstruct it when they excavated, but they just chose not to. The arch is lying on the ground. That's another illustration of this mound. It looked really good. This is a, the finest preserved amphitheatre in Britain. And yeah, I agree with what uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth is saying It would, and, and any of the other writers. It would be difficult to defend the, the, the legionary base, but it would be easy to defend this, which overlooks the legionary base, overlooks the water, overlooked everything. Perfect defendable position. And there it is. That's a, an aerial view before the excavations. I think this is an aerial view from probably about 1950, 1960. You can clearly see the humps and bumps. That's what it looked like, right? Completely covered up. I covered up so much by the flooding of the Usk that, you know, it was discernible, <laughs> but barely discernible. Um, and there we go. It, it just this little bit before we end. And there it is. 1909 excavations revealed that the structure of the buried amphitheater was sound enough to withstand the ele elements it left uncovered. So in 1926, funds were made available by the Daily Mail and the Times uh, and the loyal knights of the Round Table of America for such a project. Nearly 30,000 uh, tons of soil was excavated, examined and carried away. Um, how, it, how much it was examined, I can't write. As an archaeologist of many years experience, right, um, I've seen no evidence that they had sifted material on site uh, I, I, to sift and to, to process 30,000 tonnes of soil over a period of year would need would need a lot of people. Right. Um, and to get results, it was something else. Um, Nash Williams, the excavator at um, Landswick Major. Um, Tessa Wheeler took over the excavation the remaining eight months. They handed the site over to uh, the, the Office of Works. But here's a little bit more information. This is the last slide. There it is. And uh, if this was a bit, oh, there it is. There's Tessa, Tessa Wheeler. Spot the woman. But she was the one who was uh, directing the excavation. Yes, women held whips back then. And they were really, I tell you what, there are so many, uh, Dorothy Garrod, uh, Gertrude Bell. You've got the likes of Kathleen Kenyon, uh, Gertrude Cato Thompson. The list goes on. And Tessa Wheeler, the wife in her own right as an archaeologist of Sir Mortimer Wheeler, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there we go. It's basically showing there, and we know where Tessa Wheeler is. Um, and it's talking about um, Miss, Mrs. Tessa Wheeler was head of the dig at the time of the photo was taken, though her husband, Dr. R.E.M. Mortimer Wheeler, who start, started the work in 1926, is more usually associated with the excavations. His name is all over it but his name is on the front of the report. But she's the one who did the last eight months of excavation. She's the one who got down to the nitty gritty. So um, what we're gonna do, we're gonna call that a day. Okay, thanks, I'm glad you waited tonight, and I'm glad you were really patient. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna call that a day, um, and we're going to um, stop the, oh, stop the share, uh, Michelle at the Hawkwin concert. Um, there, stop. Right. Okay. okay. Go for it. Roger, um, anything you want to say? We've had six people online. Anyone want to say anything online? Please do so. Roger, speak, please talk. No. no, that's fine. Followed that well. It was interesting, very interesting. And your theory is looking out of the rest. Yeah. We did a lot there tonight, Roger. Hell of a lot. Flipping out. And I tell you what, if you do want me to. I, I don't know. We, we've got another two lectures. I wasn't planning to do another five, but if you guys did say, you know, look, pal, we, we, we want to do a bit more. We want to get into these sites in more detail. There's so many um, early medieval sites in Wales we haven't done. So, but we I, can talk I'd about that. carry on that. with another one. I'd carry yeah, on, Carl. Well, yeah, we, we, we could do. We've got another two lectures of this se season, if everyone else feels. Tell you what, let me know next week, okay? We'll have an answer next week. So we've got two more lectures of this um, pattern, and then right. we can have a chat if yeah. we want to continue that. <laughs> right, Roger, nothing else, Rog? No, that's it. I'll put them on. Thanks, Rog. Right, um, Ellen, don't ask me for any spellings, but you've had them on the screen, but if you need anything, Ellen. you need to know now. Would it be possible to have, like, a copy of all those finds in Dinas Paris? Know the pictures okay. we were showing. Right. What? What? Okay. Okay. Right. All right. Then I'm going to bribe you all. Right. 
if you want copies of all these images, right, I can get Rona to send these images to you, right? I, I, on, on the precursor um, that um, uh, you all sign up for the next course, so you can decide that next week. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, uh, it was Landailo I went to. Oh, it's Land Right, I got it. Yeah. It's Land Dilo, Land Dilo, not Land Dilo, Land Dilo. That that that's what the uh, that's what we say down. Land Dilo, Land Dilo, Land Dilo. Cumbi, I went oh, to Cumbi. Land Dilo. Yeah, Land Dilo. Or you could say it like someone from North Wales. Land Dilo. It's I went just to Cumbi. Down the road in from Land Dilo. <laughs> Right, okay then, Ellen, I can do that. I can do that, but we'll have a chat about it next week, okay? Okay, thanks. Um, anything else you want to say, um, 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 Ellen? I was just going to uh, tell uh, that Candela is just down the road from Custard Carre Oh, I don't know. <laughs> and to, yeah, and to just down the road. It's got and a massive the, bridge there. And to the first, not far away either. <laughs> Mocking my Welsh accent. Right, one, 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 one sec. Everyone, just stay there a minute. Um, hello, hiya. Hello, is that Caroline Church? Yes, it is. Speaking. That's good to know you. Right? Just check in. Uh, your past gets you there, we each have. Just carry on talk stay then, is it? Uh, yes, you, you, you'll see a gate uh, along the bend. That was good timing then, wasn't it? <laughs> Imagine having to wait until the Tesco delivery arrived. Can you pick me up? Thank you. What? Yeah. Well, what I'd like to say is we've been distracted here Thank you. because the police helicopter has been going round and round and back oh, and please. forth and round and round for the last ooh, 40 minutes or so. Oh, no I can't imagine there are many crooks out running around in the pouring rain tonight. They might be training or something. It just seems... Who knows they're what they're, they're doing? They're they're Oh God, it's just annoying and loud. What? Yeah. The helicopter. Well, that's it, is it? Oh, here he comes again. <laughs> Where's he going? Hmm. I don't know, just around and round over the town, I think. Yes, very often looking for people running away or something or lost rather than anything else, I think. Yeah, like I say, but yeah, in you know, the rain and it's so on. Yeah. yeah. Annoying. It used to happen a lot more often when they used to yeah. steal cars all the time. They'd oh, be out chasing geez. the cars. That's right. Hi, everybody. Cars coming back on now. <gasps> okay. <laughs> he's really? just rang me to tell me that he's coming back <laughs> on now. <laughs> He telephones. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's coming back on to me tonight. You're popular. Sorry, say again. Everyone's trying to get on to me tonight when I'm busy. <laughs> How are the dogs? Have they enjoyed? Fast asleep. Yeah. Yeah, oh, fast asleep. Lovely. I'm going home now. <laughs> what did you think of the lecture? Brilliant. Yeah, it's always, always good fun. Always things to think about. Always things to so yeah. much history of question them. and yeah. put put together. Why did they do that? What's that? Yeah. I love that. I didn't even know of Dana's powers until Carl mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. I didn't. Not far away from me. And I think, well, never yeah. knew quite what it was. Soon it was Norman or something, but you don't know. Yeah, well. Out Bumble here in West Wales, we don't know about the things all over the place, so it's just no, it's, it's no. interesting to know where the place is. Right. right, again, sorry about that. Right, um, Ellen, anything else you want to say? No, I, I was just saying that it's it's uh, 
uh, until you said a couple of weeks ago about Dina's powers, I never knew it existed. So it's but, really but interesting. Now it, now, now it does. We can definitely. I'll get you those images. I'll get you those images. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, right. Yeah, okay. Yes. Anything? Anything else, Alan? No. No. That's it. Okay. Right. Okay. Finally, now, um, Kate and Ruth. Before we go. Brilliant. Yeah, great fun, really interesting. Okay, okay. Anything else you want to say before we sign off? Not I'm going to be dreaming off. of strap ends. Okay. Strap ends and die and right. we're, 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 spindle whirls. And... Guys, we'll, 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 call, we'll call it a day in a few moments, so we'll be doing a listing pillar next week. Okay. Okay, mate. Okay. Illic Illic Illicit pillar and some other carvings from that period so anyway uh, have a think about um i'm doing another five classes um in well you know obviously we've got next week and the week after um and obviously we can work out the dinner's powers images and if uh ruth kate uh um ellen roger is there anything else you want to say before we finish no fine thanks no fine thanks okay well well i can say good night to all of you thank you for your support and i'll see you good next night week. professor my, my good pleasure night. <laughs> no, 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 Back here next week, uh, seven o'clock. A bit of a disaster starting on time tonight. But other than that, I've got to go. So I'm going to put my coat on. And thank you very much. Anything in the chat box? I'm going to look in the chat box. In the chat box on three, two, one. Nothing in the chat box on three. Nothing in the chat box on two. Nothing on the chat box on one. Nothing. Nobody put anything in the chat. I can't see anything. Done. Anyway, night night, folks.